Welcome to Table Talk, the place for deep conversations in the Geekverse. And trust me, when we tear into a subject, we go deep. I'm Heath, and I'll be your host. Each episode, I'll be talking with one or more creators, authors, illustrators, publishers, or other movers and shakers in games, TV, books, movies, or other areas of the Geekverse. Regular guests include Douglas A. Burton, the author of Far Away Bird, a multi-award winning historical fiction novel of the Byzantine Empress Theodora. He's also the author of The Heroine's Labyrinth, an alternative story structure to the hero's journey that often occurs in stories with feminine heroes. That structural framework frequently comes up in our analysis of story. Brianna De Silva, she's the director and co-writer of The Cultists, a Lovecraftian comedy mockumentary style web show here on YouTube. And the author of The City of Reckoning, an epic fantasy novel of political intrigue, the ethics of war, and young love. Cameron Pasha is a screenwriter, director, novelist, and was a writer and producer on the series Kings, a producer on NBC's Bionic Woman, and a co-producer and writer for Sleeper Cell. He's also written for the CW series Nikita and Roswell, New Mexico. He's been breaking news from inside Lucasfilm, Disney, and Hollywood. His analysis and commentary have become very popular on YouTube. We regularly meet to discuss and analyze stories, and when we do, we dive into graduate-level seminars on story structure and writing. Come on in and let's go deep. And when I say we're going deep, I mean you'd better bring your hard suit. Other guests have included Lou Anders, the author of the Thrones and Bones fantasy novels, Once Upon a Unicorn, the creator and publisher of the Norengard RPG, and the author of Star Wars, A Pirate's Price, the book that explains why the Millennium Falcon is on the planet Batu at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Mark Tassin, the creator of the world of Ataltus, head of Mechanical Muse, former director of the Gen Con Writers Symposium, and the head developer of the new cool name RPG. Let's see, who else? Bond. James Bond. Well, not James Bond. Not yet. Maybe soon, though. But I have interviewed Jamie Stegmeier, the founder of Stonemeyer Games, crowdfunder extraordinaire, and publisher of many hit board games like Scythe and Wingspan. Brian Colin, sculptor of the world of Revelo, Monster Busts, and the creator of the vast, grim, dark horror RPG. Ajit George, the Dungeons & Dragons author, we talked about game writing, education, and his contribution to Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft, and the development of the journeys to the Radiant Citadel. I am Hela, Odin's firstborn, commander of the legions of Asgard, the rightful heir to the throne, and the goddess of death. Well, actually, that interview got rather spicy, so I think I'd better just keep that one to myself. Kate Wilson, a YouTuber, actress, host, and prolific geek guru who's now working to make a new show dedicated to the world of tabletop gaming a reality. So buckle up and get ready for a wild ride, because it's time to explore the worlds of tabletop gaming, sci-fi, fantasy, and all of geekdom through the eyes of those who are making things happen. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger. Ready to move out. It's time for Table Talk. Hello! Good evening, everyone! Welcome to my home. Welcome to the office. Welcome to Table Talk. We have a fantastic guest tonight. This could be our most famous guest yet. This is going to be a very interesting show here because we've never had a musician on the show before except we actually already have because she was here for Doug's launch party. So you already know her and people requested to have her back. And so here she is already. We knew we had to talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. Please welcome Lucy Williams. Lucy, thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, musician. I mean, starting music therapist, then, you know, rock and roll music, then, you know, shifting into like, meditative healing music and then writing books and now i'm here <laughs> yeah we we threw you into the fire uh by having you come on that stream with doug <laughs> like, like the other night so i don't we've never we've never introduced anyone to the table talk crowd quite like that before <laughs> so thank you for doing that and thank you for being here for for doug's launch uh do, do you want to tell everybody a mo take a moment to tell everybody who you are and what you do I mean, I know it's a lot, <laughs> but to, to introduce everybody to, uh, to to you, and then we'll talk about your connection with uh, with Doug after that. Cool. Yeah, there's a it's quite a quite a road, Doug and the Doug and Lucy connection. So, what do I do? 
so I have been listening beyond my ears my whole life. I first started writing songs when I was six. And my piano teacher was like, honey, we need to put this down to music, you know, Savannah, Georgia. And so I've always been connected to that space of the creativity. And it is like so a part of my life that I don't know how to separate it. Even when I started being a music therapist in right out of college, I realized it was very natural for me to work with all these elderly patients. I was working in a neurologic music therapy hospital and I saw how I was just listening to what they needed and or listening to which song needed to flow through for them. So I guess my whole life I've been practicing listening and that's involved a lot of playing, a lot of singing, a lot of piano <laughs> lessons and practice, which led me to tour with the first tour I went on was Moby, techno artist. Uh, that back was the in first tour even. Yeah. Oh yeah. I went from like, you know, maybe I could get a gig in a restaurant in New York City because I lived there for a while to people carrying my gear for me and setting it up on the stage for me and just saying, Lucy, you, you want to check your, your sound? <laughs> it was like amazing. And that led into the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, another just stellar crew and set up and just absolutely amazing experience of not only high level music, but high level everyone involved in that production because it was so huge. And then that has led to, well, on the one side, I left to dive into my creative immersion and working on right now a unreleased project of original music with my husband. But in that space between then and now, I also, I also spent a lot of time in quiet space. Coronavirus was really nice. It stopped musicians from really going out there and doing a lot. We, we, we moved to Zoom and, and local little Zoom experiences. And during that time, I got to get really quiet and just practice my listening. And in that process, I wrote a book called The 12 Initiations with Mary Magdalene, which is like a little shamanic journey party. And I think that's like a glaze over of the whole, uh, the whole thing. Let me pull that up. So this, we're going to talk about this book here tonight because I have questions about it. I was reading it. Uh, the I was reading the sample of it from Amazon before we started the stream. So this is. Let me put this in the chat for everybody so they have the link. So here is the the title, and the link right here so that everyone has a link to that. And then you also, I'll put this up here as well. You also have uh, your general website here is lucywilliams.com. That's right. Okay. Is that the best way for people to get in touch with you? If they, I don't know if you're, oh, are, yeah. you are. Okay. So if you want to get in touch, her home base is lucywilliams.com. And then the book is over here on Amazon right here. All right. Well then let's, so first of all, we know each other through Doug because you came obviously like we're just saying on to Doug's launch party. So you did the music. Doug was telling me that he had custom music created for Far Away Bird. And I did listen to that because I, I read some of Far Away Bird because we reviewed and, uh, Far Away Bird and critiqued it here on this on this um, the show. And I read some of it and then I was like, oh yeah, I got to go over to the audio book so that I can also hear the custom music and all of that. So you... Uh, did the music for Faraway Bird. So you and Doug know each other before that, but but if you want to hear her creative, uh, her creativity in regards to Doug and you you went through the Faraway Bird audiobook, that's you. That's me. That was an amazing process. Okay, what do you what want to know? Like? You want me to tell you like, okay, okay, so Doug calls me and he's like, Lucy, I write every word of this book to beautiful soundtracks and music that inspires me and that takes me out. And I just feel like the audiobook has to reflect that. And so he described a scene for me. And it's the moment where she's inside of a church, cast out from culture because she's a prostitute and looking for some peace because the brothel's horrible. And she's in this place where she's not even accepted. Like you look around and, and it's just, that's not a place where a prostitute can be loved. And she's not finding anything to take her, any anything to give her comfort, not religion, nowhere. There's nowhere. There's nowhere. So he said, you know, I feel like 
there's a there's a song in that in that feeling. And I I mean I lost myself in that book. Literally. I it I it unfolded just so you know, I couldn't couldn't put it down. And so I was seeing this scene and this was before the book was actually finished. And as I do, I listened, I asked, you know, what is the sound of that space? And then I heard it and that's what became so loose and you'll hear it. And it's almost like a cry from her heart. And it came out as like female vocal. And so you'll hear that that's really all that's there in that, in that one song. It's very short, but it was, it, the audiobook can't really take long songs because it doesn't really make sense sometimes. So they're brief little songs, but they do carry a lot of energy. Um, I had been in this phase of recording like a choir, but just me by myself, <laughs> or I would pull my husband in to make some male vocals. And it carried an energy that was really powerful. And so Doug heard one of those kind of, they were just kind of meditative for fun. And he, he was like, this is the energy I want for, you know, the, the feel of like this soundtrack. And so that energy and that power of, of a culture, I feel like is what guided the, the, I think it's the final track, Nise Kalium, which is actually a language I call light language. It's really syllables that carry energy, but they don't carry like, you know, a verbal meaning to our cognition. So that whole song is filled with some drumming and strong vocals and a lot of intensity. And he, when he heard it, he was like, oh my gosh, Lucy, this is perfect to close it out because it's leading into what's going to become the second book, which I'm very excited to uh, receive. I think he's working on it. So then did you go through that process for the other music that was for that audio book, like reading it and then listening to what was already there to you? So to what that, to you? he had pointed out a few uh, key spots. So the, the swan um, was one mm -hmm. of them. And let's see, the very opening number is actually a song that I had already in theme existing and we just finalized it for his. So it was, that was one of my meditative kind of chorally, you know, Lucy singing all the parts kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, it was interesting because when all that was happening, it was like, this feels so big. And it also felt like I was doing nothing. I was just playing around with a microphone and then come to find out that song was for Doug's book. So that one was the only one that came like pre-Doug. Sometimes I think art just, you know, I have, I do have this vision of like that creative space, because if you're creative, you've probably noticed you got a creative idea and exactly simultaneously someone else got that same creative idea, like across the world. It happened with the Foo Fighters one time when I wrote a song and I was like, I had recently recorded it, you know, like into my voice recorder just for the idea. And then their new album came out and it was literally on the album. I could not believe it. So I feel like there's this place where there's like that creativity space and these ideas are just coming to earth and whoever's going to bring them in there, you know? So I feel like that one might've, might've been coming in for Doug before I even knew, you know, I don't know. These are the, these are the spaces I can go. Yeah. I can play in. Well, we talk about, we, we've talked about this idea about going whence dreams come we've used that phrase and we've talked about, we were talking about it in the context of writing, but it could have been any type of creativity uh, that uh, this is, wait, who, who is the author? Well, have you seen this book right here? So this is uh, Robert Olin Butler, actually Sable Phoenix recommended this one. Whence dreams, mm -hmm. when, uh, from, from whence you dream or whence you dream from whence you dream. Yes. That's the name of the book right there. So, um, I, I, I don't know. I guess some of us call it like getting into the zone or something like that. That's like, okay, because it can be very difficult. I, it, you know, when you're uh, focused on other things to get into this zone or whence dreams come or something like that to bring your creativity forward. So you're big on that. I'm big on that. Absolutely. It's, um, it's just always been a part of my life. And these are the hour long chats 
Doug and I would have, you know, on, on various phone calls throughout wherever we were living and all over the country. And there's so, it's sometimes eluding you, you know, sometimes you really want to create this thing or back, back when we first started hanging out, it was, it was me writing music and him writing stories. And we even did this thing where we gave each other an assignment. So like, for example, one, one thing he assigned me once was like, okay, Lucy, write a song with a clarinet, a, a keyboard and a something else, like something, you know, something really random. Oh, oh, a steel drum. <laughs> And, and then I was like, okay, you write a story about, I don't actually remember what I assigned him, but we would, we would challenge each other because we realized if you don't play in it, it can kind of disappear. And then something covers it up like a heaviness or like, you know, day to day, you're getting in, into the flow of life and it's just like, you don't have time for it. And then you forget. And then like a year has gone by and you kind of didn't play in your favorite space. So uh, I think over the years, and that was when we were like 18, 20, like very young, we realized that in order to access it more, you have to just do it more and be in that space more. And he set up like this amazing, like rigorous schedule. Like I think every morning at 6 a.m. he would write like every morning. I haven't gotten that rigorous with myself, but I noticed that when I play more, whether I'm performing or doing gigs, that space is more accessible. Something about allowing yourself, um, well, on the one hand, it's not allowing yourself that relaxation to happen because I feel like when you relax, it's like an opening and then you can just hear, you can play and you can't play if you're clenched up and if you're stressed out and if you've got to hurry up and you've got to go do, do this and you've got to do that. And, oh, maybe I'll write later on tonight and, blah, 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 and all this stuff. And then it's like six months later. And so I've realized that more than anything on a day to day, I have to remind myself to play actually play like it's cool that you're you know being a musician you get to play it's literally your work is playing <laughs> but if you think about making your work play too even in your work which may or may not be related to your creative field you might start to get those creative drop-ins because you've you've opened just a little to allow that flow that 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 connection to that from whence dreams come space you know does that make any sense? <laughs> yes, yes, it does. It does. It does. I, 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 I struggle with that because I've got tons of things going on, and then things don't get written, and I'm like, man, I feel like such a diva because I didn't just sit down and write. <laughs> like, oh man, I got all these things, but it's it's very difficult when you are stressed out and there are tons of things going on. I, I went up, uh, like I deliberately went two weeks ago to a winery to sit and write, and it went extremely well. So blocking out that time is very important. For Sable Phoenix for ten dollars. Thank you very much, Sable Phoenix. Sable Phoenix says the muse is a real thing. I'll let you take this one, uh, Lucy. The muse is a real thing. Sometimes you just find some object art floating out in the gestalt consciousness that already exists, and you aren't creating it. You're pulling it into the material world. What do you think about that? Oh, Sable Phoenix, you just said it. I felt my whole insides go, woo, because <laughs> it is so accurate. That is beautifully written and so true. That's how I feel. I feel like I am doing nothing. My job is to clear myself out of the way. My job is to clear judgment. Ooh, is this going to be a good song? Is this a good idea? Um, comparison. Is that as good as you two? That was one I used to do when I was in my earlier years. Like, that is just, you just don't sound as good as Bono, you know? Um, any of those types of things that get you back into rational mind, that clamps down. My job is to let that stuff go. And I've gotten to a place where I can, I can let it go enough that I can still hear my critic and my judge in there and my comparer and contraster and it's going on, but I can allow it still to, I can be like, I hear you and yet, I can tell I'm in the state, so I'm just going to play here for a minute longer. Thank you. And like doing that has helped. I mean, I had the worst, um, you know, I had the worst critic in my head probably of anyone I've ever heard of. And when you can clear that out of the way, 
here you go. You're just pulling it in. Literally, it's gifts. It's like gifts from, from that space. So beautiful. Okay. So let's talk about, okay, let's go to the career. Because like I said, you're probably one of the most famous people or probably are the most famous person that we've, well, I know we've had Christopher Vogler, but now here we, but you've been on, like I was watching you on uh, uh, the, uh, what was that? Uh, the Tonight Show? Like Jay Leno? I was watching you on Jay Leno, right? I was, yes, I was trying to catch up on everything. I mean, you've been on Jay Leno. All right. So how did all of this, like the world tour and things like this as a traveling music, let's go, let's go back there and let's start at the beginning. Okay, so I'm a little college student and I was going to be pre-med and just help people. I just wanted to help people. That was all I wanted to do. And then I got to class and I was like, whoa, this is how they teach. This is dumb. I don't, they were like, we're not going to teach you. You just have to read the book. And I was like, I'm not going to school for that. I want somebody to teach me something awesome. So I dropped that major and became a music therapist, helping people with music. That sent me up to New York City to do an internship. You have to get um, certified that way. So I did an internship at this place called the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. I was fascinated with the brain. I absolutely loved the fact that music lit up all the hemispheres, lit up all these different areas with, with just music. It lit up the motor area, the speech area, the the um, the memory short term and long term area. It lit up emotion. You know, it lit up all these areas that, like, if you're doing physical therapy, your motor areas lit up, or if you're doing speech therapy, your speech areas lit up. But music would light them all up at the same time. And so, I was way into the research and, and, and interested in that. Out of nowhere, Moby joined the board of directors of our music therapy organization. So I was invited that year to perform with a patient who had a stellar recovery and claimed it was music therapy that did it. We wrote a song together and we were invited to perform that song in Lincoln Center at our fundraiser. And our fundraisers were pretty big. They had people like um, Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow were there one year. Kevin Bacon was there one year. Um, Dustin Hoffman was there. So, so through the years, they, they really had beautiful, and Moby was there. And so I performed with this patient and I met Moby that same night. And he, I guess, long story short, asked me to tour with him as a keyboard player. He said he would love like a feminine presence on stage that would bring some power to the band that way. It was only gonna be six weeks, no big deal. And it turned out to be a whole year. And it was throughout Europe, US, and then South America, Australia, Russia, you know, just pretty much everywhere. So I went from like music therapist working with people who, you know, forgot what day it was to um, playing in front of thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> it was amazing. It was like, am I standing here right now? What is what is it like to tour on a major tour like that? It is like being paid to go on vacation where people help you do everything. <laughs> it is the most amazing experience. Every day I was like, is this my life? Is this my life? Am I literally? And the nicest people, people who tour live a little bit outside of culture. Therefore, they're just having fun every day. They're doing their favorite things. They're having plenty of time. And uh, generally, you know, a, a good tour really schedules in, a few, you know, days off. And I thought it was beautifully scheduled. And so you're not like exhausted. And it's very seamless when you're, you know, you play a show, you get off the stage, you go to the bus, you go to sleep on the bus, you wake up in another city. There's a fantastic driver that does that overnight. You have a very comfortable bunk. It's your own space. You have your own, you know, feeling in there. You make your own little zone. I sleep really well it, when the car is moving. <laughs> I, sleep, I didn't know how well I would sleep in motion, you know, unless it's something crazy, like really bumpy, bad potholes like New York. It's always bad driving through there. But otherwise, it's like the best you have this comfort. And then when you have days off, you have a hotel. Um, but so then you'll, you'll have a schedule every day and it says, all right, it's 6 PM. We do sound check. So meet at the, sometimes you'll wake up in the venue, which is if they have like showers and stuff, you'll wake up there. If they don't, you'll go to a hotel for like a day 
day room experience and use shower there and then go to the venue, meet the lobby at six, show up. It's just like, you just read this little paper. It tells you exactly where to be. That's your only thing you have to do. You just have to show up when it says banned. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, I have nothing to do until 6 p.m. So basically I was a tourist in all these beautiful cities all over the world. <sighs> it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful lifestyle. And then you show up, you do sound check, you're happy to see everybody. It's amazing. Catering, there's catering. It's always wonderful. People cooking for you, literally. I mean, amazing. And then you go chill out in the dressing room, put your stage clothes on, you know, fluff yourself up, whatever you do. I <laughs> I remember on the Moby tour, I had I had decided I was gonna do like some martial arts. So I had this, I had this um DVD, because back then it was like the old, old Max where you had a DVD player in there. And <laughs> I would slide this Budokan DVD in and I would go into the dressing room. I'd find like a, because a lot of times we were in like uh, basketball arenas and there would be just weird locker rooms empty. So I would go into a locker room and like practice my cat stance round kicks. And that would help me kind of keep, you know, not so still. But then, you know, it's stage call. You go to the stage put your ears in because you have in-ear monitors so that the sound doesn't get too crazy on stage and that the mics just pick up what they need to pick up. And there's 10, 12,000 people waiting for you out there. It's amazing. And Moby just picked you up because you were on the, because he, he was on the board and he heard you play or something. And then it was like, Hey, I need a, a keyboardist. He, you know, I asked him about that. He was at our fundraiser where I performed with a patient and one day, I don't know, halfway through the tour, I was like, Moby, how did you know I was even good? I mean, you didn't even like audition me. And he said, Luce, if there's one thing I can tell in 30 seconds, I can tell if you're a good musician or not. And I was like, okay. So he can So tell. he heard you play at the fundraiser and then yeah. brought you on board. Wow. And actually he played, he joined us. I think he joined us on drums or guitar. It was at some point, I can't remember, but. He was, he was involved. I met him like, you know, at the backstage kind of pre setup for that event, but yeah. And then it went and we launched around the world and it, the tour kept extending and extending and I was loving it. Wow. Uh, all right. So what happened after that? So one of his roadies, his uh, drum tech told me, about a gig that he worked on. He was like, it's great, man. You would be so good for that because you play classical music. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, well, it's called the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And I was like, I think I've heard about those guys, you know? And then of course I knew that one song, the electric guitar, da, da, na, 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 na. that one. I was like, oh, I've heard that on the radio. So I auditioned for the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. The, the music was great crazy hard. And I was learning it by ear. I did not have Marriage of Figaro by Mozart notated in their style. So I'm listening to like old recordings of the band and picking it out on the keyboard, the whole, listen to Marriage of Figaro. Um, and it's like crazy classical stuff that I hadn't done in years because I'd already graduated from college and hadn't been practicing. And I was so nervous and I was just like, gosh, I'm so out of practice. But uh, I guess the woman called me back while I was at a lunch meeting with the music therapy team. And she, so I go to the bathroom in this Italian restaurant in the Bronx. And she was like, Lucy, we think you're a perfect fit. And so with wow. trans yeah, with trans and Orchestra, they have what they ha call a backup band because their show is live. So a lot of shows use backing tracks and no big deal. Backing tracks fill the sound. They help play instruments that you just couldn't control. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the more ambient sounds and electronic sounds. Well, Trans-Siberian Orchestra does not use any backing track at all. They're very proud of that. They have a lot of complexities that honestly, the, the two keyboard players are mainly controlling all the, all the orchestra sounds and all the, you know, the random brass and the random bell and the strings and all the keyboards. So if a keyboard player, if any band member goes down, let's say they get really sick or they have a family member pass away or something and they have to leave the tour, they have a whole band ready to go on call. 
So I joined that band for two years, which was great because there is so much music. They gave us about four hours of music to learn two different keyboard parts and two slightly different versions. So the trans Siberian Orchestra has two groups. One tours on the west side of the country, more or less, and the other one tours on the east side of the country, more or less. And this is because Christmas season is only two months. So we copy each other. We, we both know the same exact show, but there's subtleties. You know, there's a little flair that'll happen on this song. It's a little different than that song on the other band. And so the backup band person had to learn like everything, which was definitely the most challenging musical endeavor I've ever undertaken, ever. And I still don't even know how I did that. Much easier, although still very challenging, was when I got the call to join the tour. And this was, I kind of had seen it. I just was like, I think this is going to happen. So I've just got to get good at this stuff. So I get out there and, I, you know, there's the whole piano part, yes, and all the complicated and memorizing and everything. I didn't even factor in the cues. So I have a huge bottom keyboard. I have a smaller top keyboard. And then over here, I have an organ with a Leslie and like, you know, it does all that, which is freaking fun to play. But <laughs> I had to learn when, what happened, which buttons to press. So I had to reprogram the whole keyboard to make it make sense in my, in the show flow. And apparently they did that every year, but I was, I was just like, wow, this is crazy amounts of information. So like for the first two or three weeks of the tour, like I had to go into such deep focus those first shows because I, I it was like, oh, if I missed the bell cue, then the guitarist wouldn't get his cue. Then the narrator wouldn't have his cue, you know? And so I was like, whoo, but after three weeks, it was all in flow. So uh, I survived <laughs> learning and, and then year after year, it was just adding on a few new things. So it was, it was pretty fun. So you joined the backup band. That was the, but then you got the call to actually go on. Did you join yeah. East or West coast? The East. Did you do Birmingham, Alabama? Funny enough, I actually think the West does Birmingham. Oh, really? Because <laughs> yeah. I know that, of course, that it comes, the Trans Siberian Orchestra comes through Birmingham. I can't remember. Year. There's a chance that one year we did it because it's pretty close to Atlanta, isn't it? I know we did Atlanta a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Birmingham, Atlanta. I mean, you're, you're, you're in the center of Alabama, in the center of Georgia. <laughs> All right. Right. Well, I mean, some of the drives for for the West Coast, especially, are like twenty hours in between. Oh, yeah, we're not talking about twenty hours between. Yeah. For us, like a five to seven hour drive, that's a good one. That's a nice, you know, easy sleep overnight. James says he may have seen you in Philadelphia. Oh yeah. So Philadelphia would have been where you've been. So what does this oh, mean? What did you? Yeah play on Roland Korg. I don't know that those types of keyboards. So, or yep. What? It's actually it was Yamaha motif on the bottom. The first couple years we had um, a Korg Triton on the top, but that shifted out to a smaller motif. So we had double motifs by the end. And the organ was a Roland uh, B3 simulated style. I can't think of the exact name, but if you look that up, you'll probably see it. They were hot, like phenomenal keyboards. How long were you with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra? So two years in the backup band, six years on tour. And then after that, I had, I joined, I, I, I sometimes they'll call me if they need um, backup. So I did the backup band a couple years since then too. And how long did you tour with Moby? So Moby was like one year of, okay. of a, a whole year. And then I lived in New York. He lived in New York. When he had gigs, I would join in. He started a, a, a side underground project called The Little Death, which was a band, but it was kind of like bluesy and sassy. And so I was in that. And sometimes he'd do one-offs. Like we went out to um, Sundance Film Festival and performed out there. So I was kind of in the family for several years, but I only went on the tour for one year, one full, you know, one full circle around the sun. Hmm. Wow. I, I had never heard of music therapist before. Really? Yeah, I, I, that's not something that I had heard of before. So, but the, so that is, um, tell me more about that for just a moment. <laughs> so, okay, have you gone back to that? Have you done any more of that, or was that something that you completely left? 
I think what happened was because I learned so deeply when I was going through college and through the training, I had an amazing professor of music therapy. He was like a Merlin. You know what I mean? You 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 got like the wizard as your your professor of your major. So it was just I I just loved him. And he would take it so much farther than just here's what you need to know to get out of here. He would take it into the depths of like a, a person's experience and experience with groups and how you manage your, you know, experience within a bigger group like a hospital or something. He was just it was so deep. So I got into music therapy with just like that whole body passion. And to summarize it, it's using music and the properties of music to affect change in the body in a person. So it could be emotional, it could be physiological. And I was fascinated with stroke patients. I worked in the neurologic um, wing of the hospital. So I got a lot of stroke, traumatic brain injury, um, Parkinson's. Parkinson's is wild. If if you know what Parkinson's disease is, it's it's characterized by some tremoring. It's basically a, a there's there's a you know some deterioration in the brain, which they're coming up with pretty amazing surgical strategies now for it. But in in what it happens is you know something will tremor. Sometimes you you'll freeze and you can't get your leg to walk. And if they would start a steady beat or even better sing a song that that person knew instantly they'd be able to start moving again and physical therapists would say sometimes they they would spend like many minutes like 10 minutes waiting for them to get ready to move again and so they they've learned that that's a that's a big key just starting a steady beat can actually help them start so i loved all that stuff stroke and um when it would would get your speech kind of confused, music could come in and you could use this, this technique called melodic intonation therapy to get their speaking to work with what their brain wants to say. Cause what's happened is like the connection got severed a little bit with the stroke. So this kind of stuff I was just like, and then I would like to do party tricks with my patients. I'd be like, look, we're going to do this. Come on. And then they would get so excited and we would be like, we're changing everything, you know? Um, it's, I was, fat, I was, I was a specialized in neurologic music therapy. So I did a lot of special training for that. So, you know, the brain and that can also be like, um, you know, emotional or, uh, not behavioral disorders in children, but like, you know, emotional or depression or mood, but manic depressive, you know, all the things in adults. I worked with adults mainly, but I did have a, a, a moment in the in ICU with the premature babies, which was amazing. I was a part of a study that was trying to determine, this is wild. This was while I was um, graduating uh, in, in, in Athens. I went to school at University of Georgia. And then I did another part of this in New York. So the study was to get babies to leave the hospital, they actually have to be able to suck like strong enough to get milk out. So they created these pacifiers that could detect the pressure of how much it was being sucked, which when it was squeezed enough, would click on a lullaby album that we recorded um, as a part of a, a project. When So they wanted to see if this acted as a reinforcement to the babies to continue to, to, to kind of teach them, to, if you do this, you're gonna get to go home basically, but you'll get this reinforcement. What they found was that African-American Females were the first, the quickest to discover this and white males were the slowest <laughs> and Hispanic and, you know, all the others were kind of in the middle, but that was sort of in the pilot study. I'm not sure what happened after they, after they went from there, but that kind of stuff just fascinated me, you know, like music could heal. It doesn't have to be like a drug or a, it's energy, it's sound, it's good feelings, it's, it's rhythm, it affects the brain. So I don't know. Does that give you a, a little intro to what music therapy is? It does. Yes. I, I had heard from someone else uh, who was talking about, and this was just a, a hypothesis on his part, but he was talking about uh, that the, that people, people listen to music a lot, you know, whether in their car, you know, that, that you, you're, you're, but that often the times it's not something that you're deliberately choosing. Now, I suppose now if you've got your iPod and, you know, or, you know, your, or your phone connected to your car or something like that. But for a long time, we, you, know, you might be more chosen by you, but at other times in the past, 
you're subjecting yourself to music and it's not necessarily something that you chose yourself, you know, you're being sent this. And he was wondering what the influence of influence on your mood was by music that you're subjecting yourself to that you aren't consciously doing, but what kind of conscious, what, what kind of unconscious influence or subconscious influence that might have on you? Is that possible? Oh yeah. That's a deep question. I mean, you, you know, as we become like, I'm calling it that we're becoming a conscious culture, right? We're starting to really notice things. We're starting to notice when things don't smell right. You know, we're starting to notice details of, Ooh, I didn't, I didn't feel good when I walked into that store. I don't know why I just didn't feel good. You know, this level of sort of subtle sensitivity seems to be waking up in us. So what we're feeding ourselves when we start to become a little more conscious, what we're feeding ourselves really matters. So whether it's like, you know, big pile of like macaroni with like pounds of, you know, gooey stuff that's probably not really cheese on and you, you down that, then you're like, Ooh, I don't feel so good. Or you throw on like the thrash metal that like made you so happy when you were little. I don't know why I keep this thumbs up thing. It must be new. It keeps popping. Up. I don't know why it's coming up too. Are you, what are you, are you using, are you using rumble who's, studio? Who's doing that? I have no idea. I'm just, <laughs> nothing. I'm just, I'm just clicked know. on what you gave me. Anyway, sorry for the, the, <laughs> Hit the like button, everybody. <laughs> that's what it's like. oh, man, I mean, I would thought somebody must be thumbs upping me. Like, that's cool. But I think maybe I noticed when I bring my hands up, it seems like thumbs up myself. <laughs> this is the cool people. So I just did it and it didn't work. No, okay. I'm not I'm, sure. No, well, that's, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, anyway, music is huge. Movies are huge. All the stuff, like the news, you know, the things that you're starting to notice, how does it make you feel? Music can change your mood. You throw on your thrash metal for your teenage years, it may take you back and be like the most liberating awesome. And it may be like, oh my gosh, I used to love this stuff, but this is totally not the mood I'm in now. You know, you feel it and it can guide your mood. So if you're you're, you're having a heavy day, you know, um, you're going to choose music. You'll just watch yourself. You'll choose music that soothes you. You'll choose music that maybe makes you feel better or just, or maybe you're depressed and you just want to wallow and then you'll just choose that. And it definitely affects you. I mean, if you have a specific question, I can talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> or well, is that kind of well, okay, let's let's go, and this this might continue, but I we want to talk about the book, but I want to talk about intuition first, because mm. you're big on intuition. So, what does that mean, and how has that changed your life, or or as part of your life? Okay. And what so, is it? What is intuition anyway? I, I I think we'll start there. What is intuition? Okay. All right. You know, you know that feeling. Okay, this is a good example. Like when you're booking a flight. Or, you know, and, and you're like, okay, okay, I have these options. And like, on the one hand, there's like the schedule and that, that needs to match. But sometimes I'm booking a flight and I have some fluctuation. You know, you can do that thing on kayak where they give you like flexible dates or Delta, you know. And intuition is getting the hunch that this flight feels better for some reason. I don't know why. That's intuition. You don't know why. Intuition is... I feel like, I wonder what um, Doug's doing just out of the blue. And then an hour later, like the phone rings and there's Doug on the phone. Intuition is, I get it. often it's, it's retrospective. You know what? When that guy said that, I felt something here and I could tell he wasn't being honest. And now I know, now I have proof. You know, it's like intuition is this little subtle and I go inward for intuition. I feel like it's in there. It's like a little, what's the word? Like a trip wire or something. That's like, I feel it, you know? And we live with intuition all the time, every day. It's so common for us that, you know, we don't talk about it that much. We always go off intuition. You get, you can get an intuitive hunch about like, you know, what you want to do with your next job choice. You'll, you'll, you'll feel that. So to me, intuition is very internal, right? And I've actually been training myself to understand that and to act on it and to trust it. And man, it's like the, the little bit that you learn, 
then there's more. There's more and more subtle levels. So intuition in the body. My favorite way and the strongest way for me to actually know that it is intuition is that I've started to train it that I'm feeling it in this body somewhere. So intuition does not come from the feeling space of this area. It just does not. It's it's um, deeper, you know? It feels like gut response. It feels like, ooh, yeah, I got a good gut feeling on that. Or ooh, ooh, I did not get a good gut. You know, it's that gut reaction. That feels like for me, a physiological way to know I'm, I'm stabbing myself in my gut down there, <laughs> to know that there's an intuitive response happening. And I think artists and creatives, we are operating off of our intuition like so much more possibly than people who kind of just sort of stay between the lines and, and do the thing and you know follow the, the schedule of the day and, and don't have to really think creatively too much. Because where does creative inspiration come from? Where does imagination come from? That, that question will get me going. <laughs> so I call that intuition and or, you know, the creative space. So I think intuition is that, I could say intuition is that connection between this earthly self, me, and that non-earthly space where all the creativity and all that the brilliant ideas hang out. How does that feel? Well, let, let, then let's go right to that. Then where does creativity come from? You said that question gets you going. So then what, where, where is that? Doesn't that get you going? <sighs> so many things. The first level I see and feel it on. Let's just talk about culture for a second. Earth. Let's oh. talk about earth. Let's talk about humanity. We're, we're all these people. And they've, they've started to, they, you know, the they. There are quite a few, I don't know, studies and commentaries and books about collective consciousness out there. So that when we as a collective believe this thing or have these thoughts that are all similar, then that thing sort of exists. That is sort of the way of things pretty interesting book uh if you want to go in this direction read lynn mctaggart or um the biology of belief is um what's his name it just just flew through my head these guys lynn mctaggart has a book called the intention experiment blew my mind with what is possible with intention which is thought and then the biology of belief by what is his name? It's it just flew through my head. It'll, it'll hit, Bruce it'll Lipton. Hit me. Is it Bruce, yes, is it Bruce, Bruce Lipton. Lipton. Bruce Lipton. Okay. Bruce. That's it. Thank you, Sable Phoenix. Um, that's another one that I, I just just okay. Your favorite books. It it actually just just shows you scientifically that so much more is happening. There's so much more interconnectedness. There's so much more moving with energy between people and places. And one of Lynn's, Lynn McTaggart's recent studies involves a large group of people here, like let's say Michigan, and she's got like a 250 person uh, seminar on the on Saturday afternoon. They are measuring this roomful's attention on a plant in Germany, and they're getting off the chart, statistically viable results. So <laughs> it's just like, that's just one of many demos as to the effects of energy and the effects of intention. So knowing that, back to our, where does creativity come from? There is to me, all the thoughts, what I understand is, is a wave ripples out, right? So you drop a pebble in a pool, the wave keeps going. This is like music, sound, waves, go. It was created and then it goes. And it actually, some people say, some scientists say, I got way into quantum physics when I was uh, younger. The wave goes on forever. So, you know, it can, I mean, a sound wave, a thought wave, it can move through walls. It's, not, it's just, just too small. It wouldn't. So 
thinking like that, imagine how many thought waves are on the planet Earth right now. And then imagine how many people are opening to ideas, right? And then if you want to go really broad, what is Earth? In this, in this, in the realm of the universe, these are the fun places to go. <laughs> if you go into quantum physics direction, you know, the largest thing is the smallest thing. It's like the atom is the universe, right? It's so crazy, makes your brain hurt. And at the same time, the Earth is it like 150 billion Earths? fit inside the sun, 1.5 1. 1. billion Earths or something fit inside of the sun. So like, we are like nothingness, let's get this little tiny thing. So on this grand spectrum, where does thought come from? Where does creation come from? That is to ponder, because I think you'll find your own path to that understanding. But when you do, that's it. That is where the creativity is. It is in that space that it floats a little bit above all those thoughts hanging around on earth. And at the same time, it's floated by those thoughts because it's gotta be relevant in a sense, right? It's gotta be something that can be absorbed by our culture. So, ooh, I, I, I could probably like paint some picture. I wish I was an artist, but I'm seeing such a visual as I try to describe this, that it's kind of like, the sea of humanity and, and humanity's thoughts floating this, you know, the infinite possibility of creativity space. That's how I see it up there. So you are big on collective consciousness and, and pulling out ideas from an existing kind of nebulous creative space when you were in that zone or, that we're talking about? Oh, this is okay. So, well, that was two things. Okay. So, the first part you said was collective consciousness and how did you say that? Oh, I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, into collective consciousness, we, we were talking about pulling ideas out of a, crea a pre-existing creative space. Yes. Okay, this is a quickie. Okay. So I've been studying a lot of ancient cultures. I got fascinated with, um, you know, there's ancient Egyptian culture, there's ancient... Um, Celtic culture, there's ancient, there's just all these amazing ancient cultures that go straight to this quest for, what do we call returning to source or this quest for enlightenment, right? The ancient Indian cultures, it's just fascinates me. So one of the cultures that I was studying were called the ancient Essenes and they were a Jewish sect that was around, they were the culture in which the, um, you know, like the whole, Christian story happened, right? The Jesus, Mary, all that stuff. They were born into this culture. So this culture was far more ancient, you know, than that story itself. And they have this prayer that they, they do that I've recently discovered, <laughs> found this, um, this uh, author, Edmund Seekley Bordeaux, and he went into the Vatican and discovered these unpublished things from the ancient Essenes. So one of the things they did was honor what they called the energy of creative works. And so they literally called upon the greatest, the energy that comes forth from the greatest creations of humanity, the greatest works of art, the greatest works of, of civilization, you know, of structure, of, of building, of, of creativity. And they would ask that energy to be with them and to help them be channels of that create creative stuff. So the, this, I've spent a lot of time um, contemplating creativity. So for me, and I would say for everyone, you have, and this is a big deal, you have your word for that source. And I dare you to call on that. So your word might be you know, it might be, uh, it could, I mean, a, a basic word would be like love. Okay. Love is my source. Okay. What does that feel like? Love, show me you love come through my body and, and write for me, write this paragraph, please. I would like love to write for me. You can call it life force. You can call it, you know, the creator, you can call it cosmic oneness. You can, any word works, but it only works if you get that feeling 
of connection. Again, it's that, right? So I'm taking you there. I'm taking you there to where I go to get, to get that intuitive connection happening. So when you connect to what that word is for you, one of my uh, clients said enthusiasm worked for her. I thought that was crazily creative. I love it. So whatever that word is. And for me, I, I've, I love a lot of the wise masters. So for example, Mary Magdalene worked for me to connect to that source of creativity. And so I would ask, all right, Mary Magdalene, and I'm playful about this stuff because this is like, you know what I mean? It's just like not something I was taught. It's it's playful. I would like to know who I truly am. I I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I feel like I am this body I'm here on earth. And, but really, really, who am I truly? And out of that question, the 12 initiations unfolded. And they unfolded like little adventures, little, little mini journeys like uh, shamanic journeys, if you've ever done that, it's like, um, and it's in second person. She's talking to you as you go through this thing. Now you're going to open the door. Now you're inside of the pyramid. What do you see? Look far corner. You see the altar. There's a, you know, it's, it's like what, you know, near, you know, cause you've, you've read a little, so it's, um, how did I do that? I literally did exactly that. I, I, I heard her say, now what do you see? Oh, I see a thing. And, and I just closed my eyes and kind of typed and saw and typed and saw. And here's one thing. How do I know that I'm in that creative space? How do I know that I actually am? And I'm not just in, oh, I wish I could make up. I'm just making up a little story, right? Well, I would say maybe you are. Maybe you're just making up a story when you're in that space. But isn't it beautiful? And isn't it fun? Isn't it interesting? But also, I have this feeling in my body. So one of my favorite things to do was put on headphones, which was like a cue for getting started. And then I would turn on what, um, you know, if you find them on YouTube, theta wave music. And theta waves are the brain, you know, I love the brain, are the brain wave state at which you can be very creative. And if the people recorded them right, they're binaural beat theta waves, meaning your whole head is vibrating. Your whole brain structure is vibrating because if it's done well on one ear, it should sound like boo. And the other ear should sound like boo, just barely different. But together it goes boo, 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 at the exact time speed that would mimic a theta wave. And so that helps to get out of the thinking, thinking brain and into a more open, here's that image again, that open space so that you can really have that full connection. And so when I was in that space, I could feel it. I would always feel it like in my elbows. I'd be like, nope, I'm there. So, cause my, cause my mind likes to argue. I was like, you can't do this. You're not doing, you're not, you're not, you're not listening and writing. You're making this up. You know, that's going on the whole time. And I'm like, I hear you. And yet look, I feel my elbows. They're in that relaxed place. They feel that tingle. <laughs> so I would trick myself into letting that voice just carry on, but I didn't have to pay attention to it so much because for years I would get caught up by that voice and often pause or stop writing. But it is a, it's a listening practice. All right. Hey, we got Doug. Just wait just one moment, Doug, because I, I, I want to, to ask or, or to uh, have you explain exactly what you were talking about right there and and, and explain this, because we want to talk about the book. So this is a great place to transition into the book. And then we'll bring Doug on here in a few minutes. But let's talk about the book first. So what you were talking about there is that you've got this book, which uh, let me I'll, I'll bring it up. This book right here, The Twelve Initiations with Mary Magdalene, A Journey of self -discover and a Discovery and Empowerment. And I was reading some of this before it, the, the show started, and I don't think I've ever read anything like this before. Will you please explain what this book is and what your experience was when writing it? Cool. I love your questions. Yeah, I honestly was begging. I was like, you know, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What am I supposed to be doing on earth? I feel like I'm here to do something big. What is that? Why do I keep feeling that? What am I supposed to be doing? Who am I? And then often, so I, I spend a lot of time or I, I got fascinated with like learning how to meditate back when I lived in New York and 
I failed miserably. I could not meditate. I could not sit and listen to watch a candle flame for 10 minutes or sit in silence and have no thoughts for 20 minutes. Oh my gosh, torture. And then I end up in Bali, you know, Indonesia. And this beautiful guy was walking me through an ashram and he says, okay, now you have to meditate for an hour. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. I begged. I was like, please, please, please help me. And so in that process, I, I saw beautiful visions that helped me realize, oh, I can just be playful here. I don't have to empty my mind. I can follow these visions and this wisdom that's coming through because I had a lot of it. So that became my practice. And so for about 10 years, I've been indulging in my style of meditation, which is allowing these energies that are pure love to guide me and, and, and teach me. And I always have these questions. And so I was already practiced in that method. And so then I was like, all right, Mary Magdalene, I feel, well, the truth is I was on a phone call and out of nowhere, I just heard, Lucy, you're going to write a book with Mary Magdalene. And I was like, that's hysterical. Come on. Forgot about it. Six weeks later, I was on a jog, literally like jogging in a park in Maryland. And I heard, we are going to write the 12 initiations together. And I was like, you know, I'm making this all up, but this sounds fun. You know, I, you know, it's just a funny space to play in. And so I thought, well, let's try it. All right. You, we, we are going to write the 12 initiations together. Okay. What do I do? So I just meditated, put on my theta waves and I heard, you know, stand with me in the center of the circle. And I was like, okay. And, and, and my intention was who am I truly? And the first initiation, I just saw this like, you know, ancient looking holy building, kind of like a cathedral or something kind of rising up on the horizon. And she was like, walk in that direction of number one. And, and what do you see? And it, it just unfolded like, like a little shamanic journey, you know, like a, like a role playing event that was just, I was walking through a movie. I was there. I was, I was on this adventure and that happened 12 different times. Why Mary Magdalene? <laughs> well, good question. Really good question. So I had been going to these yoga retreats and one of the leaders was very passionate about the goddess. I had no idea about the goddess, right? It just, what is that? Are y'all just like want to call God goddess or, you know, I was like, is this like religious? Like, what is it? I even raised my hand and I was like, y'all, when you say these people, they would name people like Mary Magdalene, people like Kuan Yin, people like Isis, people, and not the terrorist group, right? The goddess, um, many, many feminine deities, Bridget, Irish one, and all the, and, and I, and so I was like, are you guys like, do you feel like they're really there? Or is it sort of a symbol for something like an archetype? Or are you like talking to them? Like I had no idea. And, and they said, oh yes. They just nodded at all my questions. And I was like, okay. So um, I was, this is just new to me. It's not something we got in our culture. Well, over these yoga retreats and the experiences that they would challenge us to have, I had some very direct, what I, just like I was telling you, like hearing the voice of a goddess. And I'm like, oh, I'm just making this up in my head. But when I would reflect it back to the retreat participants, everybody was like, that is phenomenal. That is very detailed. That is very different than our experiences. And so I thought, well, maybe I have a good imagination, <laughs> but I'm talking 10 years or more. So, so over time, I finally thought, well, let's just play with this. So I read a book that highlighted several goddesses. This book was um, just, it, it was everything kind of like I already knew, but somebody wrote it in the most beautiful way. The book is called The Sophia Code. And it highlighted Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Isis, Hathor, Green Tara, and a couple of others, Kuan Yin, and um, a few more, White Buffalo Calf Woman. And I loved all of these people. And she goes into detail. And so I just felt like they were all my family. And as I, you know, they, it's sort of like, un, that book had this process of unwinding any stereotypes I might've had with any of these people. And then I just don't know, playfully. Oh, well, I did ask Mary Magdalene. I, when I started dating my husband now, you know, when you have those first little, and you know, altercations, inner difficulties, I would be like, uh, Mary Magdalene, are you there? 
I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> and literally, whether it's my creative imagination or it's actually her, boom, answer. Oh, don't worry. He'll be back. Just let him do his thing. He needs this processing time. It, it was just like always I would get these really direct answers. So I guess I started my relationship kind of there with, but I mean, it wasn't that casual. Like every time I would ask her to be present, like I would cry. Like the energy is so much love. It's just so much love. And I could just, ah, you know, feel this love that I just want to live as all the time. It's kind of a roundabout answer. <laughs> but with this book, you actually use the word channel. Did Correct. I? Channeling I Mary Magdalene. And there was a passage in your book that's actually written by Mary Magdalene. Yeah. So, so like I said, get Lucy out of the way. And I just say, tell me what to say. And then I typed it up. And and so you the know, book is, if you read it, this is experiences that you were supposed to have or that she is guiding the people who yeah. are reading to. Is, th is that what I understand? Yes. So if you read it, you are the star of the story. You are the one going through it. You are the one walking the labyrinth. You are the one climbing the hill. You are the one, you know, and, and it's, it's it's to it's to play. It's kind of like just to play and and know more of who you are. If 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 it's fun, you know. And through this, you discover yourself. That's the purpose. You're supposed to be discovering yourself. Yes, more aspects of who you are. Some some of the key. Okay, let me tell you some of my favorite wisdoms that popped out of this book for me. Okay. One of them was you don't have to do so much, but being is very, very powerful. So by being, you're actually doing the best thing. If you can be in a state that is like light, like your vibrational state is actually helpful for other people, just your vibrational state. Not that you've accomplished this and accomplished that, but that you entered a room in the, in the presence, like your presence was full peace or fully open and, and, and receptive or compassionate, right? Those high energies are apparently the most valuable thing we can offer. Joy. Joy is like the highest state you can, you know, not achieve to feel good, but to give by being in it. Like these are the things that blew my mind as I would go through just a couple of them. Hmm. I can go with more if you want. <laughs> go, go. Sure. Yeah. For example, receiving. The third initiation is all about receiving. And I thought, oh, that's, this is interesting. But it was like, how do you actually receive? And it's like three steps to actually open the body and to receive. Because think about if you give somebody a hug, right? I always notice what I'm doing. I most of the time do not notice what they're doing to me. I notice that I'm hugging. But play with that. Like, oh, I'm receiving. So different. It's so different. So this, this whole initiation teaches you about how to receive the, and this one's underneath the light of a full moon, but there are these activation codes that happen throughout that. And they're activating knowings in ourselves, deep truths that awaken. And I, I, I could read you those, but they're a highly chapter three. If you have to, if you have to just read one, jump to that one and see what you think. Cause it goes right into so many little foundational beliefs that may, you know, that may just limit us a little bit. And when we can get those opened and cleared, we're wide, you know, then we're, our possibilities are endless. Uh, well, I, I would like to go before we bring Doug on. I, so I, I don't think I've ever spoken to someone who was talking about or experienced channeling before or done anything like this or written a book like this before. But when I'm, when I'm thinking about Okay, channeling Mary Magdalene, who I was like, why her? Like, I mean, I, I, I she's not off standard completely. I mean, she, she, you know, I, if people were talking about like the Virgin Mary or something like that, okay, but I, I would say then around if I said pick someone, who, uh, a, a woman to channel who's not the Virgin Mary who's in the Christian sphere, Mary Magdalene would probably be my next. I mean, so that's so I would probably said Virgin Mary first. Uh, you know, Ver Mary Magdalene would possibly be second. Then I, someone might say Joan of Arc, you know, yeah. uh, you know, we can, we can go from there. So uh, I'm just wondering about the, or why, why not 
the Archangel Michael, you know, or, or, you know, all these different, so the Mary Magdalene, why, why you have a connection with Mary Magdalene and what, cause we could talk about the symbolic meaning of Mary Magdalene and what mm -hmm. she does and, uh, and what her meaning is. And I was wondering if there was some kind of symbolic meaning or connection with your life to the story of Mary Magdalene or, or you know, if that's relevant at all, I don't know. I, I don't know. I know that it came from the sense of this love that felt so real, like more real than, you know, I don't know, more real than like some people I have in my lives, you know? And I can say that what she represents for me is the divine mother. So, and, and, and mother Mary also represents this for me and many people, but it's that it's like, you know, in culture, God is a man, right? God is masculine. This somehow for me, Mary Magdalene just aspects that whole feminine principle of creation, really. And I never knew that in my mind, but as I look at it now and like how it's sort of become for me, that's always what it's been. So why the character? I think it came out of just the playful giddiness of being introduced to these characters in a new way through the book, The Sophia Code, and feeling so just open and relaxed and comfortable with these people who were actually on earth at some point. You know, it's, it's a different and her book is channeled, so you have to take a person. Okay, here's my little back statement on this whole channeling thing. Every single one of us is a channel. That's what we're doing when we're creating. That's what we're doing when we're sharing our passion with a friend who needs some love and support, right? That's channeling. So we all do it. It's not mystical. It's just a thing we do. It just seems like there have been a lot of hype over the, the, the earlier days, but if you Google it now, thousands of people are on YouTube channeling. You can, you can Google channeling Mary Magdalene and all these people come up, which is wild. And I only just started sharing that stuff publicly, but really it's just connecting through my flavor, through my Lucy energy here to what I would call divine love, connecting to just that bliss, pure bliss. Bliss is a better word. Love, you can find love that, that can go in a direction. Bliss, just connecting to bliss, asking a question and seeing what bliss speaks back. I could call it anything. I have connected with Archangel Michael in the same way. I have connected with many others in the same way. So I feel like just the, the actual character is more the essence of that feeling and yet it is very personal. It feels like I'm standing right across from her, you know? Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. I've, very I've interesting. never told talked to anyone with this <laughs> perspective or experience before. So this is very it's interesting. Very interesting. Well, Doug is here. So I'm going to bring Come him on. on so we can talk about this. So welcome, Doug. Hey, <laughs> what's happening? Doug. Yeah. All right. Welcome. I was welcome, uh, welcome. listening intently uh, backstage. Yes. Would you? I, like um, to... I, I will say I have read Lucy's book. I read an early version and um, I also read a later version, right? I read two different drafts. <clears throat> and the, um, the second draft was um, the one where I experienced the book. Because <clears throat> it's not like it's not like a book that just has a narrative structure like like we would normally talk about, like a fictional structure. Uh, each chapter is standalone and it's like a uh, guided meditation the weird part is cool part is when you stop trying to read with purpose and just read uh it is like um a dream the the chapters have a dreamlike quality where what you're reading just starts to go through go through your conscious state and uh i experienced some pretty amazing like auto populated visuals uh like unguided unprompted uh imagination uh moments um just amazing stuff i had to tell lucy about it and i i presented it to her as um suggestions like hey maybe this should be in the chapter but what really uh i was doing was just telling her my version of the interpret how i interpreted everything uh which was the whole point of it 
Like, for example, I remember in, in one chapter, and this is something, an example. I, I didn't come up with this. Like, it, it wasn't like me consciously trying to be creative and coming up with this. But um, M- Mary Magdalene uh, appeared in, the I think, the final chapter, I want to say. And uh, I instinctively knew that we were in the Garden of Eden. And she was laying like sideways. She had like a cloth robe on and she was laying sideways and she was, her hand was moving through the soil. And uh, then I realized that she had fruit with her. And this was like the fruit that Eve ate. And uh, she told me just by, just by listening to the the book that the point wasn't eating the seed or the, the fruit, but plant, and she planted the seeds in the soil in front of me. And I, I wasn't thinking of all this. It was like in the Garden of Eden, tree uh, fruit from the tree of life. She opened it up and then she put the seeds in the ground. And that was like the lesson. And I didn't come up with that, but it happened uh, spontaneously through uh, one of these guided meditations. And I have multiple stories like this while reading the book. So even though you're not, you know, you're fully conscious, you're you're lucid, you're, you're awake, um, it's amazing what the psyche can produce uh, when when put in that light. To me, it reminded me a lot of the creative space where dream where from where dreams come from, where your creative source comes from. So I think what her book does is tap into that. Sorry, that was a long winded way of saying that, but <laughs> I stand by it. <laughs> that, that, no, that's quite an endorsement of the book. Then, so you've been through it and you've experienced the meditation. Yeah, well, to, to where where you uh, where your psyche is taking over a little bit, and that's very unusual for a book to do, um, at least in my experience. Yeah, Sable just used the term trippy, um, except it's except you're fully conscious, you're fully awake, you're fully, you know, you're 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 like almost like you are now, except while you're reading this book, sometimes your mind starts auto populate. It's the way the book is written. It's the way the chapters are designed to guide you into this like imaginative space. That's it, Doug. The, the, the idea is for you to have your own journey, your own experience, and the words are all there and you can stay with them. But what you did was you just <laughs> allowed yourself to go where you were being led. And that is so the right way to go <laughs> with this yeah, type of thing. It, 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 it was pretty unlike any book I, I have ever read. Um, I think you even, I was listening to you guys talk and Heath, you even said that it's, it's uh, kind of a unique conversation. Um, so yeah, the book is, is kind of its own genre. Lucy and I were even talking about this kind of recently on how do you, how do you market uh, this book? You know, it seems like it's, it's, its own genre, <laughs> you know? Okay. Well, let me ask you a weird question. While, while we're, we're here, here's, here's a weird question for you, Lucy. I write about angels. This is, and I want to, and I, I want to write more about them in the future. Let's say I want to contact one of these. So then what do I do? If I want to say, all right, listen, I'm writing this story here. I, uh, this is about, I, I write about uh, Lucifer before his fall. I want to, uh, Michael is one of the main characters, as is Uriel, Gabriel, Ma- Mary Magdalene's going to be in it. Let's say I want to uh, experience this. What do I do? Like I say, hey, listen, let's 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 write this book. Like I'm trying to bring this out. I got to get in the zone, and I actually want to uh, contact one of these entities. What do I do? Okay, who do you want to contact first? Just pick one. Uh, okay, let's not start with Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> Gabriel. Uh, let's start with Michael then. Okay, so. You do your thing. However, you go into your writing place, go into your your place of work, right? I would, this isn't actually in the book. I have my cue. I'm going into the other space when I put those headphones on. I had the nice noise canceling over the ear headphones. That literally just touching my, sometimes I forgot to turn the music on, but, but just having them there signaled my body I was going into space. So that's one really good strategy is a little signal. It could be just rubbing your hands together and taking a breath. And now you're in the space, you know, it's just something that signals you that you're there. That's very, very helpful. I found that's just a little, a little pre taster next. It sounds like you are a writer type, but it also works with voice recording, whatever your favorite is. 
you can ask a question. This is my favorite way. Okay, Archangel Michael. Let's acknowledge that I don't really believe that I'm doing this. Okay, that's going to be there because I had to move through that for years. And let's pretend like we're going to talk, you know, if you have to do that. If you're already to a level where you know, you know you're contacting, you know you're in touch with this energy, then you can just be like, Archangel Michael, here's my question. Ask a question. I am working on a scene in this story, and I want it to reflect the truth that I want to come across. What is the unfolding from this point? Let's say that's a question, right? And then you literally relax your mind and start writing. Don't think, don't question. It's a little bit of a, of a, of a uncomfortable thing at first. This is called automatic writing. If you're not writing, you just allow yourself to start talking, pretending like feeling a little bit like you're Archangel Michael. This is stage one. This is the playful stage of allowing yourself to get used to the feeling of that space. Then after you realize, wow, I, I feel really different after that. Or you may go back and read what you wrote or listen to what you spoke and you'll be like, dumb <laughs> or whoa, that doesn't sound even like me. And over time, you're going to start to be more relaxed with this play. If key, if it's not fun, if it is not flowing, if you do not like it, don't do it. Stay with your already existing ways. It should feel very good. When you finish, you should be like, me, I would always have this one side like, oh, you can't do that. You wish, you know, you're just making it up. And the other side was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was like such a rush because Archangel Michael is no like, minor dude like <laughs> archangel michael is coming in with like the highest level of light you can get you're gonna feel that or or an aspect of that that's <laughs> safe for you to feel right that you can actually take in if it doesn't feel good pause play again play again you know pause play again the reason for me that it didn't feel good is because i was telling myself it wasn't i couldn't do it i wasn't working you're but it does, right but you know you'll know and I dare you to play with that. I'd love to hear what happens. No, well, I might report back. <laughs> well, I have um, a, 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 not a different take, but a, another uh, thing to add on to that. And it might be a guy thing. It might be a guy thing. I don't know. But um, I think us guys have a tendency to try to control a lot of it. Um, so like... I picture like this wellspring in the middle of my brain somewhere. And this is the, this is the powerful source of creativity. You can go in there with a, a platoon, you know, and, and go stalk it and try to pull stuff out and take a lasso and try to grab this stuff and bring it up. And you might, you might get some things and you might, you, if you're trying to control it or monopolize that space and, and, and systematize it, you might get something, uh, you might get something with it, but it's going to be hard to work with it. Uh, the best thing to do is to not go in there with any sort of uh, structured approach at all. And uh, it is a free flowing, I, I think of it as anarchy. It's like an anarchic space. Um, and the more, and the less I try to control it, the better off I am uh, in terms of, of letting this stuff come to me. You know, you can think about it like hunting an animal. If you go in there and you, like you and six of your buddies go in there, uh, all the, the game will all run away. You're not going to see anything. Um, but if, if you live there, then they're going to come to you. You know, the, the, uh, these, these ideas, this, this stuff that auto populates like that. So um, the, the, the intellectual controlled part of you is the part that's the, the least effective <laughs> Uh, I think in this discussion, this idea of channeling or being receptive to these creative signals that that come up. So it took me forever. I, I was always of the intellectual control side and um, I would have these great premises. I'd have a great premise. I'd have a great idea. And then I couldn't do anything with it. Or, or when I would try to do something with it, it was very flat, very, uh, in, you know, it wasn't good writing. And 
the, the less controlling I got. What was weird is I did all my prepackaged control work up front, like story structure. I would do all that up front, and then it would be a background app running on the back of my phone. <laughs> and uh, I, I would let more of an intuitive approach take over uh, when writing. But you need both. I do think you need both. Uh, okay. So, let, well, let's, since we have both of you here, so how did the two of you meet? Uh, <laughs> God, it was uh, a Halloween see party, where right? See where. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was working at <laughs> I was working at SeaWorld at the time. Uh, I was in the education department, and uh, uh, my best uh, friend was working at SeaWorld. Amy. Yeah, I was working with her best friend Amy. Yep. So and, I came uh, down to visit because that was Orlando. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I God, I was like twenty years old, nineteen ninety six. I was twenty years old. So uh, we, me and my my roommate at the time, Chris. We th we wanted to throw this like uh, killer Halloween party, and uh, uh, Amy brought her friend Lucy, and uh, Lucy was a lot of fun right away. I could tell, like, just the way we were getting along and joking around with each other, uh, there it, it was it, it was it was awesome. Like, I she she left an impression immediately. <laughs> he called me Boppy. That was later. <laughs> I thought it was that party. And I was like, <laughs> I am not Bobby. <laughs> God, you still well, are. Now, that connection was sparked. And I was a student in University of Georgia. So I, we were like phone friends for like, I don't know, years, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, like all the years. Have we ever lived in the same place? Ever? We've, we've only lived in the same state once. But even then, it was Florida. I think you were living I in was Naples. In South I was in South Florida and you were in Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I don't even think we met each other when we were living and that was like maybe a year and a half. So remarkably, uh, she and I have never lived in the same state. Uh, we just met each other in that one context and then we just found ways to, to keep in touch up until this very moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a long history and it's uh, so unique. And I regard Lucy as um as many things but one of one of them is like a creative confidant you know someone that if you're if you have a creative I idea you know you, you don't share them with just anybody you know you do need a certain level of trust if you're seriously trying to solve a creative problem or if there's creative anxiety or doubts or or anything like that uh lucy's been um, amazing uh she's helped me you, you What's are that? always you were always like the book recommender for me. Like you recommended life changing books for me, like whether they were in the creative direction or they were like Atlas shrugged. You were oh, like, yeah. Lucy, this book is about you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. yeah. So and yeah, we, it's, uh, it, it's been we, we, just Go like the, the amount of time, like a normal friend phone call is, you know, like 30 minutes, an hour, maybe if you really got to catch up. But Doug and I could go like hours because we'd be in these deep, 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 deep. And I'm remembering also like the amount of emails, the amount, the, oh, the, yeah. the length of the emails that we would write because it was like Massive. You know, new and, but going deep into all kinds of things. I mean, from a lot of creativity stuff, just like you were saying, and then into like culture and ideas and, you know, as big as you could go, we would we would go. There. Keith, it's like talking about Star Trek Six for you and me. <laughs> I know I brought that up to her <laughs> before we yeah. went live. I said, "Don't worry, if you want to go deep, we can definitely go deep." And yeah, go deep. Keith and I, we we would we would discuss a movie, and uh, the first time we did it, it was like two hours, and he's like, "Doug, this this was great. We didn't we didn't try to stop it." Well, that was one of the short ones, um, and then we got to Star Trek Six. We went five hours, and we made it through about a third of the movie. We went another five hours. We made it through two thirds. We it took three. It took fifteen hours to discuss a two-hour movie, and <laughs> we're we're damn proud of it. <laughs> that's impressive. All right. So Tell anyway, about... but yeah, um, it, it's that's what I was. I was just letting. It's like that, Heath. Like we're you, we could go into something, and it, there's just it's like endless fertile ground. <clears throat> All right. Tell me about the Moby concert in Greece. <laughs> 
Oh, what about yeah. getting no, to the concert is the real I story. I have a story for you on that. <laughs> oh, my God. So, okay. Um, geez, where do I start? So, Lucy was with Moby at the time. She was a keyboardist. <clears throat> and, you know, she's one of my friends. She's like, Doug, I'm literally traveling the world. We're in Prague. We're in Budapest. I was like, what? I mean, I was playing rock band doing the same thing. Uh, but she was doing it for real, <laughs> you know, and uh, and at the time I, you know, I was making really good money as an appraiser early on. And uh, I was like, hey, I'll come out there. I'll come I'll come see one of your concerts. This will be great. So we kind of settled on Athens, Greece, um, which wasn't uh, the Rock Wave concert, I think it was called. Yeah. So me and a friend of mine named Tim, who's also one of my best friends in the world, uh, we decided we were going to go to Lucy's concert in in Greece and and see her there and and meet the band and all this stuff and um, so we we bought the I bought the tickets uh, and we were supposed to fly to Alitalia. We were flying from Orlando, Florida to JFK. We get to JFK and I we noticed that the uh, the lady behind the thing is totally flirting with this guy to the point where the, the whole line's getting annoyed with her because we're all like uh, you know we got to go. We get up there and uh, she's like, oh, we don't have your ticket. And I was like, what do you mean? I bought the ticket. I have my boarding. My theory is she sold it to that guy that she was flirting with. <laughs> okay. That she gave my ticket to this guy. So suddenly we're in JFK, New York, and we, I don't have a ticket to get to Athens. So we're like, uh, what do we do? She's like, just stand over there. This took me out of the system. The second I walked away from that counter and stood over there, I was invisible. From that point on, I was like a homeless guy who had walked in and just asked for a ticket. So I was like, hey, uh, I, I still expect to get over to, to Greece. And she's like, sir, just stand up. Like I was the annoying nobody who had no business being the bump, flight, bump, flight, bump, flight, bump. And uh, we slept in JFK airport overnight. And the next morning, there's like the new crew from Alitalia coming in. There is a video on YouTube somewhere that we posted back when this happened. I look very young. <laughs> uh, we, we documented this whole ridiculous thing. Uh, we, it took us forever because nobody wanted to help us. They were literally treating us like, uh, like I was asking for a free ticket. We finally get a ticket from somebody at noon the next day. So it's almost 24 hours later. They book us on a flight to Madrid. So like, don't worry, from Madrid, you'll get there. And uh, so we fly to Madrid. Same problem in Madrid, except now everyone's speaking Spanish. So they're like, you know, you know, sir, you know, in Spanish, just stand over there. Just leave us alone. You know, we don't really know why you're here. <clears throat> so no Aren't one's helping us. We finally Greek. book a flight. Yeah, it's insane. We're, we're documenting this whole fiasco. We finally book a flight to Rome, which is supposed to be a hop, skip and a jump over. It's like a two flights from Rome to Athens. And we have like eight hours in Rome. So I get to Rome. And me and my buddy pretty much sprinted through all the sites of Rome. Like, we're like, there's the Colosseum. Oh, there's the Parthenon. You know, just uh, there's St. Peter's Basilica. There's the Sistine Church. So we did everything we could. We, we got wine. I got pizza out on a cafe in Rome. It was amazing. And then we had to rush to the airport to go to Greece. Meanwhile, I'm emailing Lucy. I was like, hey, our flight's delayed. You know, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, whatever. I was just trying to... No word from Lucy. And like, Tim's like, have you heard from Lucy? I was like, I have not. <laughs> uh, she, obviously, we didn't get there yet, uh, but I haven't heard any. This is like 2005. So it wasn't like smartphone friendly territory yet. Like, you know, you were on the European t cell towers at the time, which was not the same. I had to go to an internet cafe. Yeah. Uh, those were still around. So no Wi-Fi. Oh, that's blast from the past. No yeah, Wi-Fi. Blast from the past. No word from Lucy. No word from anybody. Tim and I are in Rome. Like we were in Madrid. Now we're in Rome. We're still not in Greece. We have no idea what's going on. This whole plan seemed, we're like two days late. Finally, we get a ride to Athens, check into the hotel, jump in for a swim, relax. We got here. And then we noticed that Greek is uh, not the same alphabet as uh, in the United States. And they don't provide English translations like most places in, in Europe. Greece is very serious about their Greekness. So I'm like staring. I'm like, I can't tell. That looks like a backwards R. <laughs> so 
So I'm like, I don't even know where Rockwave is. So we finally find out it's in a place called Malakasa, which is like 45 minutes outside of Athens. Way outside. It's not in Athens. It's outside Athens. So me and Tim, we literally got on a, 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 tr- a commuter out to the countryside. No clue. No clue. And we're like, wh- wh- where do we get off? We don't even know where the hell to get off on this um, on this train. We're like, these guys look like they're concert going. They have a backpack. Let's follow them. <laughs> These guys are probably going to a concert. So we follow these guys. We're just dropped off in the middle of the countryside in Greece and and hoping to God that the guys that we've pegged who don't speak English are heading to a concert. So we're kind of like following them in in the countryside, mind you, keeping our distance, (laughs) waving if they turn around. Turns out we totally nailed it. These guys were on the way to a concert. We started seeing banners for the concert. I was like, oh, my God. So we're on our third day. I'm wearing a, a set of clothes I just bought at the hotel because we, you know, the whole thing was botched. And I walk up literally three days straight. I walk up to the lady at the front. And I'm like, hi, you know, my name's Doug. I think you have tickets for me. And she's like, yep, here they are. I was like, oh. out of all the things that were going wrong, it seemed almost impossible that she's like, no problem. You're checked in in the countryside in Greece. Here's the ticket. So we got in and uh, still had not heard from Lucy at this point. Um, and we just show up and, uh, it ended up being an awesome concert. We got to go backstage. We hung out with the band, uh, back there. We were hanging out on stage, uh, while they were playing. So we got to like, see it from the stage, like what the crowd looked like and everything. Unbelievable. Uh, we got to walk, Tim, my buddy was filming all this by just walking around it all. It ended up being an amazing, uh, thing, but, uh, it was absolutely insane to get there, but well worth it. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Lucy, I want to ask you next about what you think about the heroin's labyrinth and and what your experience with it is. Oh my god. I guess I guess you've read it. We're going to have to do another another whole thing for this because Well, it, go for it. Go it for blew, it. It blew my mind. And now I I'm, I'm I'm reading the real real book now. Ah, it's so <laughs> cool. It's I just, somehow it's better now that it's in book form and not on my computer being scrolled. Oh, true. The first version I read, how many years ago was that, you know? And it was, it's gone through quite a few incarnations. No matter which version it was, let's say draft A1A, the very first one ever, I was so touched and moved by this truth that was being revealed that I I, I would immediately call him, Doug, this is a big deal. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> <laughs> This is bigger than writing. This is global, Doug. This is historic, <laughs> Doug. This is, is, is intergalactic. Like I was very, I was very, very passionate about what it did for me. It literally felt like someone understood me. I, I had not expected that from a book my friend is writing for writers. Cause I was like, Doug, I don't know if I'm the one who should read this. Cause I'm not a writer, you know, certainly had no idea I'd be writing a book. And I still don't know if I actually wrote a book or not. But you know what I mean? But it blew my mind as to how it hit me on a, I would say an archetypal and subconscious level that like tweaked my inner heartstrings to this depth of someone gets what I've had to go through all this time. It was like a glass of water for like parched desert (laughs) walker. Well, she was one of the people I was sharing my notes because they were only notes for a while. Um, And I was excited about the notes because they felt like they were um, notes that no one ever had before. I was like this for me as a writer, it just felt like something a little new. But when I shared with Lucy, she she was the one that was like, no, like this, this should be a book. And uh, this is something you need to flesh out. So she was one of the main forces from shifting my focus from hey aren't these cool notes to like write like taking this serious enough to write it over four years no matter what all the ups and downs to to see it through to the end um and you know and for a while we weren't even sure we were gonna um it was gonna be for writers uh i think lucy originally had intended it to be a more universal uh discussion and she's not the only one uh i have there are other people that have said that but um knowing myself and knowing my background and where I come from, 
I felt like the only way I could write it sincerely is if I focus mainly and exclusively on writing because that's that's where I'm coming from. So I and figure other what, people. That tied it all together. When you realize that, it literally, because there was this year or two of confusion, like this is oh, so yeah. big, but where is it? Am I aiming it here, here, or here? And when you nailed it, like I am a writer, this is for writers, everything fell into place. And that the prologue is just blowing my mind. I keep telling you. You I like the final one? <laughs> milking it. Yeah, because it's even better than it was in the in the the pre-final draft. <laughs> you went into a little more detail about your 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 stance and your background, and it just it's just solid. It it it's so solid and it's so true. Nothing is nothing is not a hundred percent you. And I think that's key because you are not average. And what you bring to the world with just the way you see things, who does that? Who categorizes every single movie they've ever watched their whole lives into fitting patterns, Doug? Uh, me, Heath, Sable Phoenix, James Bacon. <laughs> Christopher Vogler. <laughs> Christopher Vogler. <laughs> okay. So what is it? So if you were not thinking about this in terms of, of story and writing, Lucy, what is it that spoke to you and what direction did that go with you, did these ideas? Well, you could say it goes into the, the rebalancing of masculine and feminine energies on planet Earth. I say the, you know, a lot of women, there's a lot, I, I would not put myself in the category of a feminist or any kind of ist. I'm not an ist of any kind. In fact, I don't know what ists do. I just stay in my center and in my intuition and I, you know, and I sense things out. But from what I read, I got this sense that women could be healed by this understanding. We we do not go, I mean, sometimes we do, we go off, we fight a war, but when he said it was the soldier's path, that literally decoded, like my whole brain just fell open into this perfect map of like, this all makes sense now. And of course I have that inner soldier in there. So I can relate, you know, to the, the, the Star Wars, it, you know the whole hero's, hero's journey. journey that's the word i'm trying to say <laughs> and and then i'm living that labyrinth like and and I, so are men men and women we're, we're both living it but but i'm rarely in life being the soldier that's just in this life i'm not playing that role a lot i am inside of culture loss i am going up and someone is taking my sacred fire remember when sacred fire wasn't in there that one came in as just this puzzle piece that blew the whole thing open. Yeah. Am I right, Doug? Wasn't it one of the later pieces that you were like, this makes everything make sense? Yeah. I, I, I was getting frustrated because I was like, why the hell does the Minotaur want to possess the heroine? I could not make sense of it from an archetypal standpoint, because if you look at stories, you know, there's the obvious stuff like she's hot, right? She's beautiful. You know, so the Minotaur wants her. But then there's all these stories where like, like the Minotaur is trying to possess her, but it's not necessarily about beauty or sex. So I was like, there's something else, there's something else that these heroines are dealing with, even if it's not sex or beauty, where this figure is trying to monopolize their creative energies, trying to capture them, trying to hold them. They want them, they want to possess them. And <clears throat> it, I couldn't make it fit until I thought of a heroine holding a sacred fire that the Minotaur wanted. I was watching uh, Quest for Fire, Quest for Fire, which is a crazy, uh, but kind of cool, weird movie. And there's all these cavemen and they have this little sacred flame and they're running around with it. And these other cavemen are coming up and trying to take it from them. And they're trying to keep the flame. I was like, that's, it seems like this is what heroines are going. <laughs> like there's everyone's coming after their sacred fire. So thinking of them as having a sacred flame, gave me a click on what it was that was being, what it was that, that they wanted. And I had to break it down into a creative power and a attractive force. There's something that is attracting these people to the fire. And then there's something about the fire that they wish they had. Mm -hmm. And I decided it is that, or wish they had or wanted to control. And I figured it was the sacred fire. And in a lot of movies uh, and stories today, the heroine, uh, it is expressed as creativity. And I think even men can understand this because if you have a creative power yourself, you know, it's an attractive force. If you're ever an artist, you, remember in grade school, everyone like hunches over and stares at you and watches you draw like, and then other people want to like want a piece of that. So anyway, yes, that, that was, that, that was, was a big one. Biggest 
that hit me in such a way. I was like, oh my gosh, this explains. And I look back, I'm in a, I'm in the rock and roll industry. So just to give you perspective in the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, there are about on, on, on just the East coast tour, there were 190 or so people working on the tour every year, maybe six of them were girls. Really? Dang. So it, it's, <laughs> Being in this, in, in, I, I could, so when Doug added the sacred fire, I could look back over my life and see like, oh my gosh, I've been in all these man dom men dominated industries. And not that it's only men. I mean, women can also try to take my sacred fire, but it was sure. just, I, I watched my past unfold in total understanding. And I had never been able to understand it before, which immediately offered me empowerment. Oh my gosh. This is a natural, this is a natural thing. And it's natural for the Minotaur to take the sacred fire. It's just a natural progression of the story. Now I, now I'm empowered. It, and, and before it's like, you're depleted and you don't know. So, I mean, it, it hit me on such a personal level. And I know that's not even what you were trying to do, but that, that was my experience. Well, 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 I was going to say, so you may have already answered this question then, but when you said that you live and walk the labyrinth, what does that mean? So I, yes. don't, I'm walking inside my native culture. I haven't gone too, too far from home. I'm inside of the cultural stereotypes. I'm a, you know, I should have this and this and this according to culture by this age in my life. And if I don't, then I've got to deal with that pressure. I don't know who to trust. It's the labyrinth. I'm inside the hair. Does that make sense? Well, and I got this from you, the game scenario, the idea that you're told you can win and lose. If you do this, you live happily ever after. If you don't, you lose the game. You're stigmatized. You know, there, there's all of the this pressure. And that's why a lot of these are manifested as game-like scenarios in, in my interpretation of this. Um, and, and listening to some, somebody like Lucy intimately, like where you explain, you know, Doug, this is what it was like to be in TSO. This is what it was like to, you know, to tour the world. Or listening to my mother. This is what it was like to be in corporate America, you know, or my wife. This is what it was like to, to be here or there or here. It didn't matter where, where, where the, the, the stories were very similar. And so um, that sense of a, a game rule, win, you could win or you could lose. That's what your elders are telling you. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the heroine. And there's that sense of, you know, people are watching. Do I turn left? Right. You know, you know, you got to be careful in here, you know, so. Th that's where I think the maze imagery comes from. Uh, this feeling of navigating carefully places that are supposed to be safe and familiar and comfortable and friendly, and but not always. There's like this menacing issue behind all of it. Lucy, let's talk about what's going on next for you and where you're going and where people can talk about. We've got, we're coming up on a couple of hours here. I, we don't want to, we, we could go, Lucy, put in the comments if you'd like Lucy to come back. Because I feel like <laughs> Lucy should come back. I feel, I feel like I, maybe she could guide me in some, some channeling and, and meditation with the, with theophany and we'll see what we come up with and she might have to come back. If you'd like for her to come back, then please put in the comments. Um, but let's say, Lucy, so, okay, now that you've done the 12 initiations of Mary Magdalene, is that something that continues? Or where do you go from that? I don't know. Where, do, where, where does someone go from that? Where does someone go from that? Um, you know, what? an I idea, an idea or a an intuition that, that actually came today was to guide live I shouldn't say this out loud. Now I'm going to have to do it, but guide an initiation live. Ah. Let, her, let her lead a new one, like on the spot. Maybe I'll have Sam do some music at the same time and, and see, I, I was like, what? That sounds terrifying. What if it's just dumb, <laughs> you know, because when I'm typing, at least I can see if it's good before anybody else has to read it. But if you're just streaming it, but, I've gotten to a place where it's actually really easy and really fun and, and it's my favorite bliss space. And so I'm, I'm trusting it. So that might happen. Um, I'm realizing that I've started working on a rare, you know, on a, on a, with a couple of people 
um, using the Magdalene wisdom to, you know, get them to achieving exactly what they're aiming for in life. Mm. And that has been profound. And I had no idea this would head in that kind of a direction. And so in the process of that, I got the very direct inspiration, I could say direct instruction that this is not to be kept only to my own personal healing anymore, that I'm, you know, I, I can feel safe in sharing it. I think truly, this is a whole nother thing. It's probably part of my heroine's labyrinth, but I'm kind of terrified um, of being out in public. I've literally like terrible with social media. I'm, I don't, and I realized the other, the other day, like la a couple months ago, like, oh my gosh, this is just fear of being seen in public. So I've been, I've been very, very quiet about, you know, just my personal journey. And I don't know, maybe being in front of thousands and thousands of people just is a natural state to just be very personal about things. But the message is no, just start sharing, just start sharing. And it, it is so beautiful what is being shared. So when I share, as opposed to going through like a journey, it's often it's just a class of, of like crazy, brilliant wisdom of, of, for example, like know thyself. Well, what does that mean? And she'll guide us through an experience to know well, that. You're the master of the labyrinth. You can now guide us through it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that. That's exactly it. So, ooh, cool, Dougly. I hadn't put that together. I'll be sometimes here for I, more. <laughs> sometimes I call him Dougly, so that might slip out. <laughs> We've only known each other for how many years? Like 1996. So how many oh. years is that? Oh, don't talk. Let's not calculate. No, <laughs> none of these dates, Doug. Oh my God. That's a big number. <laughs> so anyway, I'm moving outwards. Lucy is Ariadne. That's awesome. There we, there we go. Although Theseus slays the Minotaur, it is Ariadne who leads them out of the maze, even in mythology. <clears throat> yeah, nice. She ties a string. <laughs> Like breadcrumbs, and this is a motif in stories, Moana, there's seashells that lead her in. <clears throat> if you look for it, you'll actually see breadcrumb um, analog uh, imagery in, in stories. But Ariane would tie a string all the way through the labyrinth, so all she had to do was follow the string to get out. So she solved it, whereas nobody else could. <laughs> James me. Bacon, Douglas Avenue Burton. <laughs> I know. Oh, Lucy doesn't know what that is. Uh, there was just a typo in one of our um, summaries, and I was uh, Douglas Avenue Burton that day. <laughs> <laughs> so the the big the, the the running joke is that Doug's la Doug's middle name is Avenue, <laughs> Doug Avenue, <laughs> which is a very labyrinth like word, by the way, an it's Avenue, really Douglas Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what what is next? Okay, so if that's what's going on with the the twelve initiations, and what next? What, what are you doing now and what are you doing in, let's say, the physical world, Lucy? The physical world. <laughs> um, with mortals I've, running about. Yes. I've been what renovating the house. Yeah, that's, that's the next thing. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that. My daily, lately, it's, it's, it's house renovations. That's very a new world for me. I, I, I wasn't really built for heavy mantles, um, but that's the wrong thing to call them, but... Anyway, that's happening. Jackhammers and all kinds of things. But we made it through the bulk of it in our house. And we have a another little guest house that we're working on right now. So, But we still have to finish the music studio. Oh. Um, but I also teach voice coaching. And I'm actually leading. A, I'm going to start in May on May 7th. I'm going to be kicking off an eight-week intensive voice coaching experience. Okay. What I have learned about voice That's coaching right that is totally it look at you is that it is directly related to literally everything in the heroine's labyrinth as far as getting out of that thing right it is the center of our strength as people so when people do voice coaching and they generally they approach because they want to sing better their whole lives start changing Literally, like things that you know, one woman was like, I, I, I get seen. My family responds to me. They didn't use. To, they kind of would just talk over me at dinner. Now they hear what I say. The book club actually took my opinion and talked about it for the first time in my whole life. Like, so things start kind of changing. People find their partners. People's careers get clear. And 
So it's what I'm realizing is there's so much power in connecting to that central source. And like Doug was saying there, you are visualizing like a wellspring inside of your mind, but yes. I visualize my wellspring like deep down and it rises up to like here where my creativity and my inspired ideas will come from a lot of the time. But that's where your connection to your power comes your physical physically it's your core right so i'm realizing there's a lot of there's a lot of magic to singing and i've been doing it now for several years so i'm excited about a group experience so that would be amazing if uh doug you could join <laughs> i will join <laughs> you have got a good singing voice <laughs> oh, I'm a great singer. And I know absolutely nothing about music at all. And people, my, even to. my mother would laugh at me when I was singing something in church. So this is exactly <laughs> what I do not need. <laughs> that may have scarred you away from music. <laughs> well, you, know, you I, have a very good speaking voice, Heath. So something's working because you're very connected. You. Well, I I, 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 speaking, <laughs> I'll, I, I will stay with speaking instead of singing. <laughs> Hey, uh, creativity takes many forms. Music is one of them. I uh, I said this in the chat earlier. I've recently gotten into this like freeform drum percussion solos, like from the movie Birdman. When I first heard it, I thought it was just noise, but it must be an ADHD thing. I bought the vinyl and everything, and I will play it now. And, it, and it's it's not just the sounds; it's the fact that they're perfectly recorded, perfectly recorded. Strike on the cymbal perfectly recorded, you know, hit of the snare or the bass. So it's pristine sounds and it's, it's asymmetrical. And for some reason, my mind just takes it and like goes with it. And, uh, it's like, I think I blame, I figured it was cause I'm ADHD that this somehow just helps steer the, the chaos a little bit. So yeah. anyway, music is a great tool. I, I can't even write without music. Speaking of music, I don't think I had mentioned this before, but I, I need to do this on stream because when I came to Austin and then I, I drove that that like I, I drove up to or I didn't drive up, but Sherry Lee drove me up to Doug's house. Like, here's the house. Mm -hmm. I walked in. This was it was like perfect people. Oh, exactly yeah. what you would expect when you walk into Doug's house. Like, oh, there's Doug. So I, I opened the door into Doug's house. And the Klingon battle theme music from the motion picture was playing. I opened the door into <laughs> Star Wars, the motion picture, Klingon battle theme music. That's how I walked into Doug's house last <laughs> week. <laughs> I was like V'ger. <laughs> right. right. That's exactly what's going on. Do not return signal, Mr. Becker. All Sorry, right. I'll just start your quote. <laughs> uh, Lucy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, guys. It seems like you have been very popular with the chat here. I, I think there, so people want you to come back. Will you be? Will you return and and talk to us more to. about all of this? I would love okay. to. Well, well, that's great. So I, I I will talk to you more, and we will we will we will have you back because we go deep here. Like I said, ordinarily, what we do is we have somebody on for sixty minutes or sixty to ninety minutes as a single to get to know them and what they do, and who they are, and their approach to life, and that kind of thing. And then we will have them on again, and then with other people and things like that. But you just jumped into the fire with <laughs> everybody on Doug's stream. So now we've gotten to know you more, and, and who you are, and what you do. And, and we would love to have you back, especially as you're doing more things that you're trying to get out to the world, and let everybody know what it is, and things like that. So uh, it would be amazing to have you again. It's amazing. Thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. High vibes. Doug, high five. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to uh, close Wait, this out. Gotta... Oh, I, I should say, uh, like, we're getting ready for uh, the the cultists, or first of all, the RavenCon. I I got tickets on the uh, which is coming this Saturday. I got tickets up, but I'm going to put out uh, is it tonight or maybe tomorrow. I didn't get completely finished, so we're having RavenCon on Saturday. RavenCon two. The tickets are up on ravenkeep.net. If you're a member of Heath's Geekverse, I will send out a, um, I, I'll send out a post that uh, about how you can get a discount, twenty five percent off, if you're a member of the Heath's Geekverse channel. But Raven uh, Con that is this Saturday, uh, and then we're we're gonna we're gonna try and then we're gonna blow the blow the house down. We're gonna have a lot of fun. But then also, I do want to say since uh, so I'm coming over here, 
uh, we've been promoting the cultists. We are now on the cultists, which if you don't know the cultists, this is my web show uh, about modern day Lovecraftian cultists who just want to worship Cthulhu in a world full of people who don't understand. I am the produ creator, producer, and co-writer of the show. Brianna, who is often also on the show, is the co-writer and director. The first two seasons, first three, excuse me, first three episodes are already up on the channel right now. But what I've decided to do is to release the entire first season, 10 episodes, starting tomorrow. Brianna and I are going to be releasing them uh, with also our commentary because we also have director and producer commentary. So tomorrow afternoon, Brianna and I are going to be scheduling the entire first season, hmm. not only the, uh, the next seven episodes, but also. Um, the director's and the producer's commentary, as well as behind the scenes uh, making of props and, and that kind of thing. So if you're not on The Cultists, please do come by and subscribe. The Cultists, I'll put that in the link in the uh, in the comments right there, uh, because that's our next big thing, getting The Cultists up, because it is amazing and we need a lot of people looking at it. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I will be in touch about RavenCon. I'll be sending out emails. I'll be sending out posts. Uh, I don't think we have a table talk this Thursday. I, I need a little bit of a break. <laughs> and I'm still not recovered from being in Austin. Uh, so tomorrow I'm going to be I'm going to be recouping myself and things like that. But we will do RavenCon on Saturday. Then on Sunday, of course, we'll have uh, the Heath. Uh, uh, we'll have uh, uh, the morning grind on the Heath Geek Birth channel, and we'll keep going. Thank you, everyone. Yes, please do like the stream. Thank you, everybody who's been here live. And thank you to everybody who's going to watch on replay. It has been fantastic. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. See you later. Good night, everybody.